But on the other hand, when a prophetic utterance comes, examine it carefully and hold fast only to that which is good. I'm reminded of something I used to say to the Africans when I was working amongst them some years ago in East Africa. I said to them, remember not everything that the missionaries have brought you is good. Some things are good, some are not so good. But I said, that's no big problem. When you Africans eat fish, you know what to do. You swallow the flesh and you spit out the bones. And I said, you do the same. And I say that again today. We don't have to swallow all prophecy. We swallow the flesh, which does us good. We spit out the bones, which wouldn't do us any good. I've said that prophecy needs to be judged. How are we to judge it? I want to give you now three simple, practical, scriptural tests. First of all, does the prophecy agree with Scripture? The Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture, and the Holy Spirit never contradicts himself. So the Holy Spirit will never say through prophecy something that is contrary to Scripture. The second test is this. Does the prophecy uplift Jesus Christ? The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church is to reveal and uplift Jesus Christ. Anything that does not uplift Jesus Christ is not from the Holy Spirit. Revelation 19.10 tells us this specifically. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All true prophecy centers in the person of Jesus. The third question, does the prophecy edify God's people? We remember that that was one primary purpose, edification of God's people. If the prophecy doesn't build up, doesn't strengthen, doesn't encourage God's people, then there's no reason to believe that it's from the Holy Spirit. If we turn to the ministry of Jesus for examples of prophecy, interestingly enough, we can't find them. I believe the reason is that all that Jesus said and did was prophetic. So there was no particular situation in which he was specifically prophesying because his whole ministry was prophetic. However, there are other examples of prophecy in the New Testament which are interesting and helpful. I'd like to look at one in the life of Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul writes as follows to Timothy. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good fight. Now, we have to fill in the background. Elsewhere in his epistles, Paul says that Timothy was appointed to his special ministry by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery with prophecy. In other words, it would appear that the particular course of Timothy's life that God had planned for him was indicated through the gift of prophecy, and that through the gift of prophecy, Paul and the elders were moved to lay hands on Timothy and set him aside for his ministry. And it would appear also that those prophecies gave great encouragement and promise to Timothy of what God could do through him. But when Paul wrote this first epistle, he was warning Timothy against the spirit of fear, against giving up. And one of the things he said was, remember the prophecies that went before. You remember that God is with you, and though you may have opposition and trouble, nevertheless God is going to fulfill what he's promised. Well, this is a very beautiful use of prophecy, which I've experienced several times in my own life, when I have been discouraged or oppressed or wondered whether I could make it through, I've recalled prophetic utterances that have been given in the past and they've encouraged me and strengthened me. However, we need to say one word of warning about directive prophecy. It should not be the only means of guidance in your life. In 2 Corinthians 13:1, Paul says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Don't act only on a prophecy. Let it be one of the means which will guide you into God's will. Now, I'll just close with a brief testimony from personal experience. Some years back, I was in England preaching in a church that I'd never visited before or since. I was due to speak in the Sunday morning service, but I arrived there early, and the people were having a prayer meeting before the service. So I knelt down and prayed with them, and after a while, I heard various people giving prophetic utterances. And they were speaking to a certain person and about a certain person and describing things in that person's past life. And suddenly I realized with a shock that I was the person. And I knew for sure that none of those persons knew anything about my past. 
Well, when God had got my attention in this way, then they began to make statements about what God intended to do through me in the future, in particular, a new kind of book that God was going to prompt me to write. And this really spoke to me, gave me encouragement and direction at a critical moment in my life. And let me say that later on, that particular kind of book, I actually did write, and it's now in print. So here's an example of encouragement, direction, stirred up, cheered up, motivated by the gift of prophecy. Yesterday I spoke to you about the first of the vocal gifts, the gift of prophecy. Today I'm going to speak to you about the gift that many people find the most difficult to understand, the gift of tongues. We need to bear in mind that in the language of the New Testament, the word tongue also meant language. So you can call it the gift of tongues or you can call it the gift of languages. Usually it's referred to as the gift of unknown tongues, but in most cases in the original Greek, the word unknown is not actually there in the text, although the context indicates that it must have been an unknown tongue or an unknown language. Now we need to look at some general principles about the tongue to understand some of the problems. The tongue is the problem member of the body. It's the one that causes at least 50% of all the problems in our lives. James 3.8 says, no man can tame the tongue. No man can fully control his own tongue. What is our tongue given to us for? In the Psalms, David calls his tongue, my glory. Why does he call it his glory? The answer is that the supreme purpose of the human tongue is to glorify God. That's the reason why a tongue was put in our mouth in the first place. Consequently, every use of the tongue that does not glorify God is a misuse. I doubt whether any of us on that basis would deny that we are frequently guilty of misusing our tongues. The answer is really that no human being can fully control his own tongue. That's why we have to have the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit to enable us to use our tongues aright. In Romans 6.13, Paul says, Present your members as instruments of righteousness to God. In other words, we're to offer to God all the physical members of our body as instruments for him to use. The most desperately urgent need is to present our tongue to God because that's the member which above all others we cannot control. Now, the first actual instance of speaking in tongues that's recorded took place on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descended the waiting believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, the first immediate result was that they began to speak with other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them to speak. This gathered a crowd of Jews from all over the Roman Empire who were there for the celebration of the Feast of Pentecost. The Jews understood the languages that the disciples were speaking, but they also knew that the disciples themselves did not. They were just Galileans. So we see clearly that speaking in an other tongue or an unknown tongue means that a believer, through the supernatural direction and help of the Holy Spirit, speaks a language which he has not learned and does not understand, but could be understood if there was a person present who knew that language. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, and again in verse 28, Paul refers to this as kinds of tongues. I understand kinds to mean different uses or purposes of tongues. So I'm going to mention three specific different purposes of tongues. The first use, which I believe is primary and basic, is for direct personal communion with God. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Paul says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. That's very clear. When one speaks in an unknown tongue, one is not speaking to men. One is speaking to God. One is speaking from the Spirit. One is speaking mysteries. That is, things that the natural understanding cannot fully comprehend. And two verses further on, Paul says, One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, builds up himself. So though we do not intellectually understand what we are doing, when we are speaking to God in a tongue, we are speaking mysteries, and we are building ourselves up spiritually. Paul goes on again in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 and 15. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit, 
and I shall pray with the mind also. I shall sing with the spirit, and I shall sing with the mind also. Paul indicates there is more than one way of praying. There's one way of praying with the spirit, when we do not know with our minds what we are saying. There's another way of praying with the mind, when our mind is fully aware of what we are saying. Paul says both ways are legitimate. We need both ways. He says, I shall pray with the spirit. He says, I shall pray with the mind also. My own background before I came to know the Lord Jesus personally was that of a philosopher. I was a professional philosopher. And I studied languages and I studied books and I traveled and I, in, I indulged in the arts and I was interested in music and painting and poetry and all sorts of things. And yet there was a deep inner dissatisfaction in my life which I simply did not understand and I knew no way to meet that need. And then, in a very sovereign way, God revealed the Lord Jesus to me, and I received this beautiful ability to speak to God in an unknown tongue. And uh, when that happened, I realized that in my philosophic ignorance, I had completely ignored the most vital part of my own person, which was my spirit. I'd been nourishing my soul, nourishing my body, but starving my spirit. And all this time, my spirit was calling out to express itself and to communicate with God, who is the Father of spirits. And when God gave me this supernatural ability to speak in an unknown tongue, then for the first time, my spirit could freely express itself to God without having to go through the narrow bottleneck of my own little mind. And that brought me the most tremendous inner liberation. Indeed, I realized by reading scripture that what I was doing was communicating with God, speaking mysteries, and building myself up. And I thank God that I have enjoyed this experience almost continuously now, almost every day of my life. For nearly 40 years, I treasure it highly. It's very, very precious to me. The second use, or the second kind of tongues, is when an utterance is given out in a public assembly in an unknown tongue, and is followed by the interpretation into a known tongue. When that happens, then the combined use of tongues plus interpretation is equivalent to the exercise of prophecy. However, in my talk tomorrow, I'm going to deal specifically with the interpretation of tongues, and so I won't go further with that particular use of tongues in my talk today. So I'll go on to the third use of an unknown tongue, or tongues, one which many people are not really very clear about, that is, an unknown tongue as a sign to unbelievers. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Paul says, So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Notice that tongues are for a sign to unbelievers. What's the meaning of that? Well, let's go back for a moment to the day of Pentecost. What happened? The Holy Spirit came on the disciples. They were filled. They began to speak with tongues they did not know, unknown tongues. But the unbelievers round about, when they gathered, recognized the languages. And they were overwhelmed by the realization that these men spoke languages perfectly and fluently, which they themselves understood but the men who were speaking them did not understand, and consequently their attention was arrested, and they were made ready to receive the message that Peter went on to preach to them. So that's tongues as a sign to unbelievers. It's unusual, but it's something that has not ceased. I know a church in a certain city in the United States, an Episcopal church, where there was a lady who's delight and ministry it was to go and visit the sick in a certain hospital. As she was walking through the rooms one day, she came to a man sitting propped up in bed who looked very dark and unhappy. And so she went over to him and began to speak to him, discovered that he didn't understand English. Now this lady had more faith than a lot of the rest of us, so she decided just to speak in an unknown tongue. She didn't know what tongue she was speaking, but she just began to speak. And the man's face brightened up, and he began to listen, and he answered her in the same language, and she answered him, and they had a conversation. And the whole 
attitude of that man was changed. Later, she discovered that she'd been speaking Canary Island Spanish. That was his mother tongue. She was able to find somebody who spoke Spanish, and that person was able to come and minister the man in his own understanding. But it was the initial use of the unknown tongue that had arrested the man's attention and made him open to the message of the gospel. Or I could go back to an earlier part of my life when I was pastoring a church in London, and each Sunday evening for what we call the gospel service, our daughters and other members of the church would bring in people who were interested. One day our eldest daughter named Tekva brought in a young man from Wales whose mother tongue was Welsh. Well, I, we went through the service and I preached my message. And before I knew what was happening, an elderly man in the congregation who was known to all of us stood up and began to speak very clearly and distinctly in an unknown tongue. Well, I was a little frustrated. I really thought he'd interrupted me and spoiled my message. But the young man turned to our daughter and said, Why is that man telling everybody about my sins in public? It took us all about ten minutes to convince that young man from Wales that the older man didn't know a word of Welsh and didn't even know what language he was speaking. Believe me, the attention of that young man was arrested that day. And let me tell you, he later married the young lady who brought him to the meeting and is now one of my sons-in-law. So that's an interesting example of the use of tongues as a sign to unbelievers. In my talk yesterday, I dealt with the gift that many people find the most difficult to understand, the gift of tongues. Today, I'm going to speak about the gift that goes directly with the gift of tongues. In fact, the gift I'm going to deal with today has no meaning apart from the gift of tongues. It's the gift of interpretation of tongues. By simple logic, there can be no need for the use of this gift of interpretation unless it has been preceded by a tongue, that is, an unknown tongue that needs to be interpreted. Let me first define interpretation in the light of that. Interpretation is the ability supernaturally given by the Holy Spirit to present in a known language the meaning of something that has previously been given out in an unknown language. Now the person who brings the interpretation may be the same person who gave the utterance in the unknown tongue or it may be another person. The scripture leaves room for either possibility. Essentially the purpose of interpretation of tongues as thus defined is the same as that of prophecy. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 4 and 5, Paul says this, One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. The test of the use of these gifts is edifying. How much edifying do they achieve? Now, speaking in an unknown tongue edifies the one who speaks, but nobody else. But prophesying edifies the church, the assembled company of believers. Therefore, prophesying is said to be greater than speaking in tongues because it edifies a greater number of people. Now, when tongues is followed by interpretation, then the meaning of the tongue is communicated to the people who can hear and understand and as a result, it accomplishes the same effect as prophesying would do. So it puts tongues plus interpretation essentially on the same level as prophesying. Then again, in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 12 and 13, Paul goes on to say this, So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Notice the ultimate purpose is edification. Then he goes on to say, Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, why should he pray that? Because he should be desiring to edify others beside himself. Speaking in a tongue, he edifies himself. But when he prophesies or when he interprets what he's spoken in a tongue, he edifies others. Now, you may say, well, isn't that rather strange that God will give first an unknown tongue and then an interpretation? Why couldn't God just give the prophecy or the interpretation straight away? Well, ultimately, I think there are some questions that we'll have to get answered direct from God. But let me give you three reasons why I see that this is practical. First of all, if God gives 
to one the utterance in an unknown tongue and to another the interpretation, he is promoting the interdependence of the members, and that's one of the great aims of gifts. Paul, after speaking about the gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, goes on to speak about the body and its members, and one of his main points is that every member needs the other members. So when one speaks in a tongue, but the interpretation is given through another, each of those members needs the other for the final result. Secondly, generally speaking, speaking in a tongue that's not understood by the mind dethrones the human intellect and thus makes room for God's sovereignty. One of our problems in the church is that in many cases we've run things simply on the level of our own intellect. Everything we had to work out and reason before we would accept it. But God operates on a higher level than our intellect. And one of the ways that God operates to bring us down from the enthroning of human intellect is to minister in an unknown language where the poor human mind has to step back and say, I just don't know what's being said. That's very good and very healthy for most of us who trust too much in our intellects. Uh, another practical reason is that it sometimes happens in a meeting of God's people that people are not really attentive and ready to hear a prophetic utterance. But if first there comes an anointed, articulative, articulate, authoritative utterance in an unknown tongue, it arrests people's attention. They realize God is trying to get through and say something. And if people are pop properly trained in such a situation, when that kind of utterance comes in an unknown tongue, there should be silence, and everybody should be in a prayerful, attentive attitude, waiting and praying for the interpretation. So that's a third reason why sometimes it's practical for God to operate through a tongue and an interpretation, and not merely through a prophecy, because people are not always ready to receive a prophecy, but a tongue will prepare the way for them to receive an interpretation. Now I'm going to look at the regulations for the exercise of both prophecy and interpretation which Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's important to understand that these gifts need to be regulated. Paul begins in verse 26, What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Notice again that the ultimate purpose is always edification. And through these supernatural gifts, when God's people to come together, each one can have something given from God to contribute. Nobody needs to sit by, passive and silent, just listening to other people. It makes every member of the body potentially active. Then Paul goes on to say about speaking in a tongue. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter... Let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Paul says, a public utterance in an unknown tongue is out of place in the assembly unless it's to be followed by interpretation. So a person who gives such an utterance either should be able to interpret himself or be confident that there is another person present who can give the interpretation. Otherwise, it's legitimate for that person to speak in a tongue but not out loud. Paul says, let him speak to himself and to God. There are some people who just don't realize that it's not necessary to speak out loud in an unknown tongue. It's perfectly legitimate to do it to yourself. Then Paul goes on to the regulations for prophecy. He says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. I've pointed out before in my talk on prophecy that prophecy should always be subject to judgment. It should never be accepted uncritically without being tested. So when two or three prophets speak, the others with that gift and ministry present are expected to assess the prophecies and say whether they are to be received as from God or not. Both with uh, tongues and interpretation and with prophecy, Paul says two or three. I believe the reason is that God doesn't want his people having a meal that consists only of one course. One course could be the exercise of tongues and interpretation or prophecy, but there are many other aspects to the total diet that God has for his people. So he doesn't want his people just to get wrapped up in one particular manifestation and exclude his other provisions for them. Then Paul goes on to say very remarkably in verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one. 
so far as God and Scripture are concerned, it is perfectly possible for all believers to prophesy. Ye may all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. It doesn't mean that the first time a person prophesies, he's going to prophesy like Isaiah. He may stumble and hesitate and be a little timid, but he can do it in order that he may learn. Then Paul says the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. That's very important. When a person is operating in the Holy Spirit, he's always in control of himself. This is a lesson that some of us have had to learn the hard way. A person who does something foolish and out of place and then blames it on the Holy Spirit and says the Holy Spirit made me do it is out of line with Scripture. The Holy Spirit never makes a child of God do something. The Apostle Peter said the Holy Spirit bade me go. But he never said the Holy Spirit made me go. Evil spirits will take over human personality and compel them to do things that they don't intend and are not responsible for, but the Holy Spirit will never do that to a person. And then it's all summed up in this statement, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So we see that the two ultimate objectives of Paul in these directions are, first of all, edification, building up, and secondly, order. Now I'd just like to say briefly how God gave me this gift of interpretation. I came out of a background of philosophy. I was ignorant of spiritual things, but the Lord Jesus revealed himself to me sovereignly and supernaturally and filled me with the Holy Spirit. And immediately I found I had this ability to speak in an unknown tongue. So every night as I lay in bed before I went to sleep, I would speak in an unknown tongue, and then I would find myself speaking in English but I wasn't choosing the words that I was saying, and I was amazed at the things I was saying in English. So I turned to the New Testament, because I didn't know where else to turn for an explanation, and I found these phrases, tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And I suddenly realized that God had given me this ability to interpret the tongue that he had previously given me. And I recall now the first time this ever happened to me, I spoke some words that amazed me and astonished me, but in those words, God gave me a brief preview of his plan for my life. Looking back almost 40 years later, I have to testify that what God showed me then through that gift of interpretation has been progressively fulfilled ever since. For more great teaching from Derek Prince, tune in to Derek Prince Legacy Radio on a station in your area. Or you can listen online anytime at Derek Prince.